Everyone, tonight we start Galatians. Yay. Yo, and I've been digging in Galatians for the last few days. I think I've wrapped my head around most of it. But I want to find out from you guys. When I say Galatians, what is the first thing you think about? Yes. One at a time. Greek. Galilee. Galilee. <laughs> Laws. Laws or Lords? Laws. Laws. Some adults? Okay, it's a good, good one. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a province. Okay, it's a region. Anyone else? When I say, when I say Galatians, what do, you, what do you think? First thing that comes to mind. Thank you, man. Thank you. Okay. Is that it? Jordan, when I say Galatians, what do you think of? Tennis. Okay. Great. Okay, cool. So, Galatia is a place. If you guys remember when we went through Acts, Acts 13 and 14, Paul found his way in Galatia. You don't remember? Okay. But during Paul's time, it was a Roman province in Central Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. Yeah. I've got actually a little map, which I'll pass around. You guys can have a look at it and pass it around. There we go. Have a look and pass. The geographical name is derived from the Ghouls because its inhabitants were Celts or Ghouls. Bit of worthless information there. But it's made up of Northern Galatia and Southern Galatia. Northern Galatia, we don't really read about. There's uh, towns like Ancyra, Pessinus, Tavian, Tavium. But the South, you would recognize these names. Antioch. Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Who recognizes those names? Okay, we've got about a 4% conversion rate. Very good. We spoke about those in Acts. We're going to go through a little bit of that tonight. But Paul's letter, this Galatians, was most likely addressed to the southern area of Galatia because that's where he went. Okay? So like with any letter, we want to find out a few things. We want to find out when... It was written, who it was written to, why and what they're dealing with in this letter, and what else, where, where it is. So the first one I thought to tackle is when. Does anyone know when it was written? Yeah. It has to have been after Paul's second journey, right? Because in the letter we actually see him referencing the Galatians, Speaks a little bit about his journey. So it must have been over or past 51 AD. His first, his first journey was around 45 AD. His second was 51 plus minus. So this had to have been after 51 AD. Otherwise, we don't really know. Okay, we can have a best guess at it, but it doesn't really matter. 51 AD, just think about that. That's all you need to know. 51 AD plus. Who wrote it? Who wrote Galatians? Paul, yeah, sure. So I thought we'd frame Paul again. For those that weren't with us in Acts, we framed Paul a few times. But let's, let's frame him because you've got to understand the man and you've got to understand who he's writing to in order to understand what the context is and what's actually being said. This is the goal of the introduction to Galatians. You need to understand what's going on behind the actual letter. That's what we're going to be doing tonight and hopefully get through Galatians 1. So we know that Paul wrote it, but let's figure out Paul. Paul was born in Cilicia, which is modern-day Turkey, which was one of the largest trade centers on the Mediterranean coast. He was born between 4 BC and 5 AD. We don't really know when, but it was around that time. Um, it was a long time before that, one of the most influential cities in Asia Minor because of Alexander the Great, during the time of Alexander the Great, it was one of the most influential cities. So Paul was born there. If you look at the map, who's got the map? He was born, you can actually see there in Tarsus, in Cilicia. Um, Jerome, a historian, tells us that his parents originally came from a Galilean town called Gishkala which was then later taken over by Rome. So if you ever wondered how Paul is a Roman citizen, have you ever wondered that? But yet he's still Jewish? 
His parents and most likely his grandparents were from a, a town, a small town in Galilee that was previously taken over by the Romans and then they were enslaved. He was then taken, well they were taken, to Cilicia and he was born there. So he's Jew, but he was born a Roman. You'll most likely find his dad or his granddad became a freed slave, which then allowed him to have citizenship. Okay, so that's how Paul has that citizenship. Um, and what Jerome tells us is that around the age of 13, Paul was sent to Jerusalem. Why? To go party with the Jews? Why, kiddies? Who did he study under? Gamaliel. Well done. He studied under Gamaliel, one of the great sages of Judaism. So that's his early life. What we then find about Paul, let's just write this down here for you guys. Okay. If you have a look at the scriptures only, in Philippians 3, 5 to 6, we find out that he's of the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised on the eighth day, and he, considered him, him, he considers himself a Pharisee. What do we know about the Pharisees? They believe in afterlife, they keep the Torah, and... And the oral law, did they believe in angels? Yes. Okay, and then what was the opposing sect to the Pharisees? The Sadducees, and they were pretty much opposite. They only kept Torah. They didn't keep the oral law. They didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in angels. That's pretty much it. When you're dead, you're dead. That's why, the, remember, when we, when we tackled Acts, when every time Paul brought up resurrection, the Sanhedrin nearly fell apart and imploded. Because the one believed it so vividly and the other one was so vehemently against it. That's why. I don't know how they managed to run the country like that. And how the Sadducees actually managed to disregard resurrection because it's so evident in the Tanakh. I wonder. But anyway. So Paul's a Pharisee. Um, and he also says then, Philippians 3, 5-6, to 6, he says, Based on the law, he was faultless. Which is actually pretty impressive. Then in Acts 22, he says he's a Roman citizen. So, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, Pharisee, and circumcised. Now, this circumcised topic is going to come up a lot for all those guys that get uncomfortable when we say circumcised. It's going to come up a lot in Galatians because that's the central theme. Now, in Acts 22, Paul says he's a Roman citizen. And he could speak Greek, Latin, most likely, uh, Hebrew, and probably a little bit of Aramaic. And we also find that he studied under Gamaliel, and it says that he was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. Acts 18. What does it say there? He was a tent maker. Who can remember what that actually meant? No. Yeah, so it was called the Cilicium. So in his hometown, Cilicia, there was something called the Cilicium, which was their, pretty much their, what they did in that town. They would take goat's hair and they would make like a raincoat out of it. That's a Cilicium. A raincoat is like a baby. Raincoat. Oh, I thought you said raincoat. And that's where he met Priscilla and Aquila. Because they also were tent makers. Funny enough, um, they met in Corinth when we went through Acts 18. They met in Corinth. They were most likely in the marketplace trying to find a place to sell their tents. That's where they met each other. And then finally in Galatians 1.14, which we'll read tonight, hopefully. says he was pretty studious and uh, passionate about... Everything in the Torah, traditions, anything with God really. He said under Gamaliel, Paul quickly advanced past his countrymen. So he was really excelling. He was like the top 10 student in Gamaliel. So that's Paul. Any questions about Paul? So now we have to figure out who the Galatians are. Paul's easy. The Galatians... Also easy, but we need to understand what sort of mix you have going on there. Why did Paul study under Gamaliel? No, 
because uh, he was probably the best guy to study under. He's like the best teacher in your school. Think of the best teacher in your school. Okay, you should know. You should know. So tell me, who were the Galatians? What do you th who do you think they were? What did we say? It's a Roman Empire. Yes? Part of the Roman Empire? That started in Jerusalem. Didn't really get to Galatia. Paul went. Paul brought it there. Paul brought, Paul brought the way there. But when he went there, who was he speaking to? That was one of the groups. Okay. But you've got to think nicely about who the people of Galatia are. Think of the Roman Empire. They went out and they conquered lots of places. They would go conquer your place. They would capture you. You would then become part of their army. They would civilize you. You would become part of Rome, although you still had all your memories of what your life used to be. Right? It's like the, the Jewish people. When they got captured, they still were Jewish, but they were living under Roman control. So the Galatians, there's a bunch of people, but there's a nice little hint in, in our Bibles. In 1 Peter 1, I've got it here, but in 1 Peter 1, how Peter starts off his letter, he says, Yeah, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua to God's elect exiles, or depending on your translation, I can say strangers, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, etc., etc., who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Yeshua and sprinkled with His blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. So Peter's writing to the Galatians as well. And he gives us a little hint there as to who he's writing to. He's writing to God's elect. Exiles, strangers, scattered throughout the provinces of. So we've got to ask ourselves, who is he actually writing to? And the hint that he gave us there is that he said elect and he said strangers. Now before we get into that in further detail, I want to take you back to Solomon. Solomon, Magdaddy of Israel, probably the richest man in the world at that time. Lots of wives, lots of porcupines. Yes, lots of porcupines. 300. And uh, <laughs> he liked his porcupines. Uh, he was weird. And he was in control of the nation. He was getting old. His son Rehoboam, who was going to take over. Remember at that time, Israel was pretty much one kingdom. And uh, Jeroboam was working at the, the Milo, Milo, whatever you want to call it. We don't really know what that is. He was working there. And Solomon, long story short, through a prophet, uh, found out that uh, Jeroboam, the servant was supposed to take over the kingdom. That was, that was the prophecy, okay? Ten tribes he was going to get. Solomon didn't like that, tried to kill Jeroboam. Jeroboam fled. Solomon's on his deathbed. He eventually dies. Rehoboam takes over. Rehoboam goes to his friends and says to his friends, what should, or he goes to the wise men and says, what should I do? I'm, just, I'm pretty new to this thing. What should I do? And the wise men, the elders basically say, look, you know, your dad was pretty rough with the taxes. Maybe you should drop it a bit. And the people will follow you. So he says, okay. Goes and he speaks to his friends. And he says to his friends, what do you guys think I should do? And they were like, yo, are uh, you like king? Make them feel like your pinky is the size of your father's waist. Your father ruled them with whips. You will rule them with scorpions. So that's pretty much what he went and he told the people. He accepted his friend's advice, which was not the best thing. So kiddies, pay attention. When your friends give you advice, maybe you should listen to the older people. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> Good. Uh, all the kids just look down. So what happened? Rehoboam stands up and he says this, and uh, everyone in Israel was like, no, not going to happen. And ten tribes, more or less, went north with Jeroboam. So Jeroboam takes them north. So if you have... I don't know how to draw Israel, but it's something like this. Okay. Pretty much northern kingdom. 
southern kingdom split at that point. This southern kingdom was considered the house of Judah. Why? Because it had Judah in it. And the promises around Judah had to remain with Judah. So the house of Judah, this was referenced as the house of Judah, currently being led by Rehoboam. Up north you had Jeroboam, and they were considered the house of Israel. Or Joseph, or Ephraim. <laughs> they, they both landed up being pretty bad. We'll discuss that now. The house of Israel was the northern kingdom. The house of Judah was the southern kingdom. So really you should have things sparking off in your brain about new covenant. I'm going to make a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This is why. But it's a lot deeper than that. And we're going to get to the point of this. No, no. These guys behaved really badly. The northern kingdom. Very big sad face. Jeroboam set up two golden calves. Not the best thing to do. He sets up two golden calves, one in Dan, one in Beth El, Judgment, House of God. He sets it up. Why? Because he's scared that all these people, when they go to Jerusalem, are going to stay there and not come back. So he was freaking out. So he said, you know what? You can worship there. You can worship there. And that's it. You're not going there. The Levites freaked out. They started moving down. That's how it was. The problem was they carried on with their shenanigans. If you read the Bible, we don't have time to go through all of that. They carried on. God sends prophet. Prophet moans at people. People don't really care. They don't really listen. So who comes down? Kiddies, if you did the lesson, tell me. Okay, now I'm talking about the kingdom. What kingdom came down to take them out? Assyria, 722 BC. Assyria takes them out. And what is Assyria known for? Taking people and spreading them out throughout the world. They would literally take everyone here, leave a remnant, leave a little bit. The rest they would take to everywhere where they've conquered and assimilate them into those cultures. Make sense? That's why they considered the lost tribes of Israel. They lost... Because they're lost. They got assimilated. They would have remembered their heritage, but they assimilated into the world. Yes? Are they still lost? Yes, they are still lost. Jeremiah starts moaning at the people. If you read Jeremiah, he starts moaning at the people and he says, Guys, you didn't listen. The same thing's going to happen to you. God is moaning at them and he's saying, You guys need to come back, follow my. Mitzvot, pay attention. The northern kingdom's already gone. They've been dispersed. They don't listen. And who comes and takes them out? Babylon. In 580 something. 586 BC. Big gap of time. But the problem is now, everyone's gone. Do these guys come back? No. no, we don't actually see them come back. That's why they're considered lost. God literally says in Jeremiah that he divorced this group. He divorced them. We had a strange, strange uh, man come up to us in Jerusalem and mention this, and I had no idea what he was talking about at the time, but now I know exactly what he's talking about. You went there, my boy. They're very upset about this. So it's a sore topic. Don't mention it when you're around a Jewish guy. They'll say, where's the document? Give me the document. And I'm like, so yeah, it says so. But anyway, God divorces them. Yeah. So you, thank you. So if you bring it up, and funny enough, the Torah portion, the setter that, we, that, that we're going to read is exactly the warning that God gave the people of Israel and pretty much a prediction. But in Deuteronomy 28, 58 to 64, I'll, I'll shorten it for you. It says, If you do not carefully follow all the words of this law which are written in this book and do not revere his, this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, and he carries on, then the Lord will scatter you among all the nations 
from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. And then two chapters later, he says, When all these blessings and curses I've set before you come on you, and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and you see there, disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything that I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, gather you again from all the nations where He scattered you. Now you've got to ask yourself, okay, they're considered in Bible understanding, according to the text, these guys, they're the house of Israel, but they're considered the lost sheep of Israel. How do we know that? Jeremiah 50 verse 12 says that Israel is like scattered sheep. Micah 2 verse 12 says that God's going to assemble the remnant of Israel like sheep. And Ezekiel 34, 34 verse 12 says that he's going to seek out his sheep. The Jewish people, these people, they're considered Jewish because Judah, Jew, means Yehudi, comes from the Hebrew word Yehudi, which means from the tribe of Judah. These guys considered these guys the lost sheep. It puts a whole new meaning on when Matthew says, I have come only for the lost sheep of Israel. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that next Saturday. But I want you guys to have this understanding that these guys got spread out. They never came back. You most likely will find, and this is what happened, that they landed up throughout the Syrian Empire, which then became the Babylon Empire, which then later, much later, became Rome. Rome sort of took over. The whole known world at that point. You can see it on the map that I passed around. That's the Roman Empire. So the lost sheep... Are these guys these guys went to babylon why did they go to babylon number one they didn't listen to the warnings they didn't learn from their brother or sister whatever you want to call it up here they landed up going to babylon and god punished them they didn't keep the sabbatical years for 490 sabbatical year for 490 years so god punished them for 70 years one year for every seven so they land up in babylon and then they come back it's important to know that they came back. The whole book of Nehemiah, they came back. If they didn't come back, we wouldn't have Jewish people today. If they didn't come back, we wouldn't have Messiah today. If they didn't come back, the prophecy wouldn't have been true. So it was important for them to come back. These guys, where are they? We're still looking for them. But, yeah? A sabbatical year. Every, every seventh year, you let your land rest. You don't plant you don't reap you leave it you leave it for the wild birds and wow. to let the land rest it's a, it's a it's a command you, you let it's like a shabbat for the land you let your land rest so that it can regather its minerals and whatnot okay all right um so what's interesting if you think about it nicely from a israel israeli or hebrew perspective these guys got divorced now according to the torah which they would keep and they would understand if god divorces someone how then is he supposed to remarry them when the torah clearly states that you cannot remarry that's a mystery to them my boy i'm talking about torah Torah says no. Torah says if you divorce your wife, you cannot remarry. Hold on. You cannot remarry. And this is the conundrum that the Jewish people were facing. So they now know this northern kingdom has been divorced. God says so. But it puts a whole new meaning for Yeshua, for them. God sent himself as man to die. So why? So he can remarry them, bring them back into the fold. This northern kingdom, these people, the Jewish people, considered Gentiles anyway, because they might as well be Gentiles. They got removed. The remnant that stayed, Samaria, 
were considered Gentiles to them anyway. They were unclean people. So when you speak of the house of Israel, you need to remember this part. Are you the house of Israel? Now that I've framed it like this, think nicely. Are you the house of Israel? I've got a no. Do I have a yes? <laughs> Why? Why are you the house of Israel? Some of you might actually be physical descendants. We don't know. But what does Romans 11 speak about? Being grafted in. You are grafted in. You are just grafted in. We, we identify more with this section than we do with this section. It's just how it is. We form part of the house of Israel. So when the new covenant says, I'm going to make a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, we are the house of Israel. Unless one of you is a Judahite sitting here. Or a Benjaminite. Yes? There had to be a death. God had to basically send himself to die as the original husband to come back and remarry. To bring them back in. He will regather. That's what he said. He will regather, remarry. You really had a question? Um, um, so if you divorce, this is a hot topic. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't remarry someone that's dead. No, but that, if that's married, yes, that's someone else. Yes. Do you think God would want you to be happy? What? Okay. We're going to go over that in detail next Saturday. So just hold on to that. Remember, Torah says you cannot remarry your divorced wife. Okay. He divorced them. So how is he going to bring them back? How's it, how are they going to come back into covenant? Through the death of the husband. Yes. Yes. Make sense? Yeah. That's what the renewed covenant is. It's to both of these. Every covenant is laid upon each other. If you actually have a look and what we're going to talk about on Saturday is the covenant in Deuteronomy 29. There's a, there's a renewed covenant in Deuteronomy 29, which builds onto the Sinai covenant. They're pretty much the same. It's just that God's saying, you keep breaking this, guys. Just before you go into the promised land, I'm renewing this with you again. And God must have been getting quite frustrated in my head. He keeps renewing this covenant with them and they go in. But we're going to go over that on Saturday. Okay. The new covenant or the renewed covenant, Brit Chadashah, is to these people. So you've got to understand, when they say scattered, when Peter was saying to God's elect, strangers scattered throughout Galatia, number one, he's speaking of these people. He's not speaking of these people. Why? Because they're not in Galatia. Some of them are. Paul was. He was walking around there. You'll probably find only a few of the Jewish people were in Galatia. They didn't really like it there. If you remember, when Paul was going through on his second missionary journey a year later, Claudius kicked out all of the Jewish people in Rome. Remember that. Romans despised the Jewish people. They most likely would have hung out over here. So when he says that, strangers scattered. Now that's Peter's epistle. So that gives us an understanding of who Peter was writing to. Okay? Paul writes to the Galatians, but it's not just these people there. That's what you've got to understand. Yes, they are young. You'll probably find most of the people that he saved like that were these people. Because they would have understood. They still had their heritage. They still remember their heritage. Why do you think in Acts 2, so many people are standing there, Jews from all nations, Jewish people from all nations, but these guys, they spoke, different they spoke different languages. They had been assimilated into the world. No, when the other guys spoke in tongues, 
They were speaking their languages. That's why you see, I've got Jews from yeah, 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 and yeah, even into Africa. Okay? So these guys are considered the lost sheep. We are considered the lost sheep because we reference with the northern kingdom, with the lost tribes, okay? With the house of Israel. That's all you really need to know about that. We are considered the elect because we grafted him. So, if that doesn't make sense, shut now. Okay, what do you want to know? Okay. All right, so we know when, we know who. Let's address where. That's a bit easier to, to tackle. So we already discussed this modern day Turkey. Paul himself went to go establish congregations in this area. When he traveled through, here we go, you can pass this around. When he traveled through on his second and first, I don't know if I've got it here. And first, he started off in Pisidian Antioch. Antioch was a very popular name for cities. There was about 15 in the Roman Empire that had Antioch associated with it. When Paul went up there the first time, who left him? John, Mark. Why? We don't know. My guess is he took one look at the big mountainous, mountainous path that he had to walk up and said, I'm out of here. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. That path that they went up, if you remember what we spoke about, was dangerous. I keep referencing this to a lot of you guys because you've got to understand what Paul went through. And it was it didn't matter. He was sick when he went up there. And he went up a dangerous mountainous path. Where one of them said, Cheers, I'm out of here. That was the start of his first missionary journey. What did In the past there used to be. I don't think at the time of Paul going through there. But in the past there were marauders and stuff. And Paul and Barnabas, when they went to Antioch, they would go into the, the synagogues. And they said that some followed and believed. You'll probably find it was these guys and one or two Greek or Roman people. And then they get expelled from that district. We're pretty much recapping Acts 13 and 14 here. Paul and Barnabas shook their feet from that area. What does shaking the dust from your feet mean? Um, saying cheers to buy and I'm here. Breaking fellowship. Breaking fellowship. Okay. Breaking. Breaking fellowship. They left them. They didn't want to listen. They just left. But if you remember... In the second journey, they actually came back to check how they were doing. Then they go to Iconium in Acts 14. And it said that a large number of Jews and Greeks came to trust. And they remained there for a long time. They spoke about love and kindness. And then what we find out is that the people of the city were divided. And they wanted to stone them. And Paul and Barnabas escaped. And where did they go? They went to Lystra. These are the places that he's writing to. Okay. So you've got to understand what happened there in order to understand what he's talking about. Lystra, he goes and he heals a crippled man. He didn't lay his hands. Remember we spoke about laying of the hands last time? If you are there, you can lay hands. In some instances, they didn't lay hands. Uh, Paul and Barnabas got mistakenly confused for Greek gods, Roman gods, Hermes and Zeus. People loved them. And then they didn't love them anymore. And they stoned them. They stoned Paul. In the city dragged him out he picked himself up luke obviously attended to him and then he went back into the city and then they then they left and they went to derby so these are the four that we know about okay the places where paul went to derby pretty much it says in acts 14 verse 20 21 it says making many people into talmudim so when he was there he this place it turned many people into disciples what is a disciple quickly a student right that follows the teacher for how long seven years and then he becomes like his teacher okay and then he has to go and do the great commission which is go out and make disciples uh, and then on the second journey who's got the second journey Uncle Vince. On the second journey, you actually see that they go and they, they go back through. Paul and Barnabas split up and he finds Timothy in Lystra. 
and has him circumcised. And we'll deal with that later. And that's where they are. So when you think of Galatians, this is what you're thinking about. He didn't go to the northern territory of Galatia, as far as we know. That's where he went. So now we need to deal with the meteor stuff. Why and what was written in the letter? Why did he write the letter? And what was he dealing with at the time? What is the hot topic in Galatians all the time? Hmm? Who said what? Not the law of sin, though. No. Yeah? He did um, the New World Christian um, versus the Torah, and there was some confusion because the New Worlds were so paganism, but now they are born again. He's pretty much dealing with one main topic Grace. in Galatians. <laughs> it's, no, he's actually refuting something. In Galatians, he's refuting the people that say you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. That's, hold on, that's what he's saying. That's what the guys were saying. He comes in and he says, no, no, no. This is not what you need to do. Circumcision is not going to save you. Okay? Eh, quiet, yeah. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> So let me break it down for you while you all refocus. And it's a very simple breakdown, okay? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. Six chapters. First one is framing the gospel. And we're going to do that tonight if we have time. Is framing the gospel. Chapter two. is talking is dealing with circumcision and he's dealing with Peter's hypocrisy or mistake as I like to call it chapter 3 is dealing with salvation and we look at what Paul is actually talking about with the custodian we look at that custodian. We'll get into that in chapter 3. That's going to be a big topic. Chapter 4, we're talking about legalism. And what it means to be a slave versus a son. Chapter 5 is the love for God. And chapter 6 is pretty much a recap with, again, a heavy focus on circumcision at the end yeah son versus slave versus son okay so what he's dealing with is this this is what he's dealing with now what i want you to understand okay and this is a very important thing to understand when i understood it there was a light bulb this circumcision party that came down and moaned at Paul in Acts 15 and they had to have this whole big debate about circumcision versus salvation versus faith versus all of that. These guys were Jewish people. So they believed in the Torah. They also had their oral laws. Hold on. They believed that if you're going to partake of the sacrifice of the Messiah, you need to be circumcised. Why? Because if you're a Gentile, you cannot approach the temple. Hold on. It's written in the Tanakh. If you're a Gentile, you cannot approach the temple. You cannot even make an offering. So how then, if you're a Gentile and you're out of covenant, is the Messiah's sacrifice going to be linked to you anyway? So although their heart was right, they didn't care if you believed in the Messiah. To them, it was just another set of Judaism. Some of them were actually believers. But they said that you have to be circumcised. This is why Paul is writing this letter. Because when he left, most likely these people came in. 
and they started teaching. No, 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 no. You can't just be saved. You've got to have faith and then you've got to do something. You've got to get circumcised so that you're in covenant, so that the sacrifice, so you can take hold of the sacrifice. That's what he's dealing with. Why do you think they were so astonished when Cornelius received the Holy Spirit? Acts 10.45 says, The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. That's why they were confused. How can these Gentiles get the gift of the Holy Spirit of the renewed covenant when they're not even in covenant before? You need to have this in the back of your mind, okay? Paul is, is addressing this. Hosanna? Sorry? How did they shout at Acts 18? How, how did they shout at Acts 18? What do you mean? No, I can't remember saying that. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. That's just the name of the sea, don't worry. Okay, so they're dealing with that. And they're also dealing with a whole mix mash of religions. Think about it. They're dealing with Judaism. They're dealing with Judaism that believe. They're dealing with circumcision parties. They're dealing with Roman religion. They're probably dealing with a whole bunch of other religions that the Roman people had brought in as well. This is what Paul has to deal with in this time. So when he went there the first time and he set up the basic understanding of what it means, of what the gospel is, not only to these people, but also the Gentiles that align themselves with the God of Israel, what does it mean for you? He set up the gospel. And then these people come in and they completely change their minds to the point where in Galatians 3, Paul is shouting at them saying, you stupid Galatians, who fooled you? He gets very uh, worked up. But there's some really good understanding when we break down Galatians bit by bit. So we're going to try to go through Galatians 1 now. Is there any questions about anything before we actually start Galatians 1? You guys are very quiet. Except for the kids. Are you guys done with this? Alright. Yes, Logan. Okay. Hosanna. <laughs> because his heart was to save as many people as possible. Thousands. And today, bajillions. Um, yeah. Galatians. Because he's upset with them because they started following a different gospel. And that's what we're going to identify. Okay. Let's start. Galatians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Yeshua and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me. He's saying that's his commission. The Holy Spirit has led him there. We know this from Acts. To the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And now he's about to go into the other gospel. But before we go into how he frames another gospel, I want to talk about the real gospel. So I need your help here. What is the gospel, good believers. This is something that we all need to understand. Well, give me what the gospel is. Yes, sir. The 
All right. You've just encompassed the Gospels, um, yes? Isaiah 52. Very nice. We'll go over that. <laughs> what is the good news, people? Come on, you can't all be quiet with this one. I need some input. No, enough input from the children. You're crunching your popcorn and shouting random things at me. From the adults. Come on, don't be scared. You can't get it wrong, really. There's a few aspects to it. Salvation. salvation. Yeah. Yay. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about salvation, Jordan. Uh, what does it mean to you? To hmm? Salvation. To be saved, right? Yeah. Let me give you a nice verse about salvation. Acts 16. 30 to 31. Then leading them outside, he said, Men, what must I do to be saved? They said, Trust in the Lord Yeshua and you will be saved. You and your household. What is that? Acts. So I've got a terrible memory. Acts 16, 30 to 31. And there's a whole bunch of other scriptures around salvation, but literally to save us from something, right? We're going to get to that. What else? Thank you, Jordan, for being brave. What else is the gospel? I thought we were disciples. Yo, you guys have been doing this a long time. That is the gospel. That, that gospel means good news. Okay, so I've had Vanessa and I've had Jordan. See? Tell me what you think the gospel is. Give me keywords. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me help you guys out here. Atonement. Let's start with that. The gospel is about Messiah's atoning death. Uh, if we go to 1 John 2 verse 2. 1 John 2 verse 2. Let's get there quickly. Somewhere, yeah. Also, He is the kapera, the atonement for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. He atones our sin. What does it mean to atone? But also to ignore. So the sins are ignored. What is the new covenant? I will remember your sins no more. That's the promise that we have. When you're part of this renewed covenant. When you believe in Yeshua, the old dies, the new creation is new. The old is dead, so therefore nothing associated with that should be around. You understand? That's atonement. Kapera is both covering and ignore. Next one, forgiveness of sins. Lots of verses, yeah? But uh, Jeremiah 31 is what I just basically told you guys now. If you go there, listen to this. This is a renewed covenant. It says, yeah. Jeremiah 31. I'll read from verse 34. No longer will any of them teach his fellow community member or his brother know God, for all will know me, from the least of them to the greatest, because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So it's forgiveness of sins. And he literally says he's never going to remember them again. That's what the sacrifice was for. The sins that we used to do, he's forgotten about that. So should you. If you've been born again and you've been baptized, the things that you did or the things that were done to you, the sin in the life that you had is washed away. 
This is an important understanding of the gospel, guys. This is one of the main key factors of the gospel. You need to let go of what you were. Tam? Or will know God, yeah? Yes. Right. Right. That's a process to build a relationship. Right. Yes. That's what we're going to talk on now. Access to God. Yeah. They're gone. Yes. Yeah. They ignored or expired. Covered is not a nice thing, but in a Hebraic understanding, that covered means it's, it's got a whole bunch of other connotations and symbolism to it. In our understanding, it's important to note that those sins are no more. So what you used to do, you shouldn't be anymore. Remember the understanding of baptism is what? You go into the water, which symbolizes chaos, death. You die in that water. And when you come back out, you're something new. That's a new creation. That's the picture of Noah being lifted up by the kapera, by the pitch. What was the Hebrew word for that? You remember? It's kap yeah. By the covering. By the covering lifted up, Noah was lifted up by the covering above that chaos, above the death. And a new creation of earth stemmed from Noah at that point. And it's an important understanding there because eight people stepped off that ark. One of them went pear-shaped very quickly. Ham. Ham. Raised a few bad kids. Hmm? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. The covering that covered the bottom of the ark that actually helped it be waterproof and lifted up. Well, we are lifted up by Yeshua's atonement, by His kapera. Because of that, we are a new creation, lifted above the water. It's incredibly important to understand this, guys. You cannot continue being the old man or the old woman. You need to let that person go and you need to focus on new creation. Yeah. But his blood is the covering. It's his blood that atones for us. The door, yeah? D for door, yeah? Yes. The. Oh, you're getting deep, eh? You're in that authority and death cannot touch you now. Right. You're in the house. You're part of the Father's house. You're in that covenant. You've crossed that threshold. Yes. Yes. Very good. It's an ancient understanding. They used to put a, they used to cut out a niche in the floor, pour blood in it, and if you walk over that door frame, that... Um, what do they call it? Uh, threshold. threshold. If you walk over that threshold, you're saying that you're in covenant with that person. Into God's house. Into, God's, into the house of God. Okay? You're, in, you're in covenant. You're protected in the Passover understanding. That's right. Um, so what, what was that? That was atonement. Okay, we've done forgiveness of sins. Access to God. A nice one here is 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Can't even read my handwriting there. But anyway, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Listen to this. For God is one, and there is but one mediator between God and humanity, Yeshua the Messiah himself, human, who gave himself as a ransom on behalf of us, etc., etc. We can approach God. He is our mediator. We can approach God through Yeshua. That's the understanding. You can pray to God through Yeshua. Why? Because Yeshua atones for you. 
When God looks at you, He looks at the spotless person because Yeshua's already paid that price. Remember when Yeshua was crucified, what tore in the temple? The veil. That thing was weaved like this, like this, and in all other directions. That thing was really thick, really strong. All of a sudden, it tore. Why did it tear? Who's the only guy that can go into the Holy of Holies? The high priest, once a year, right? To atone for your sins. God tears that veil, and it's a symbol of we can approach God now. We don't need a high priest on earth anymore. We have a high priest in heaven. This is what Hebrews is all about. Yes? Yes, boy. Didn't turn white anymore. That's right. That's tradition, though. That's in the Talmud. Eh? All right. Uh, resurrection. It's a key understanding of the gospel. Why? Are you guys, when you're dead, what happens to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Your foundation was founded on the foundation of the Areopagus, my friend. Incorrect. What happens when you're dead? What happens later? Yeah, that's the plan, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Is this why we believe? <laughs> right? Who else was resurrected? Huh? Yeshua. So if we're going to be like Him, we too are going to be resurrected. Amen. Amen. John 11. Okay, let's have a look here. John 11, 25 to 26. Oh, I'm worried about you guys here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole study in and of itself. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that another time. That's, we'll get deep into rabbit holes with that. I'll talk to you after class. Okay. John eleven twenty five to 26. Yeshua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever puts his trust in me will live even if he dies. That's right. Bless you. Whoever puts his trust in me will live even if he dies. And everyone living and trusting in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's where you all shout, Amen. Amen. We too will be resurrected. Can I just check for something? Yeah. Yeah. I am. That's right. So when you're speaking to Martha. Right. Uh, another key point of the gospel is obedience. Because can we just live a life that we want to live? Does that sound very good to you? If you go do whatever the heck you want to do. You've been baptized and now you go do whatever you want to do. You go live, you go drink, you go gamble, you go do whatever. Does that sound like you're living a godly life? No. Yeah, maybe Joel might say that that's fine. But if you look at John 14, verse 15, and 1 Samuel 15, <laughs> did, that one, did that one break you? 22 to 32. <laughs> oh, struck a chord. All right, John 14, verse 15 it says, If you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and He will give you another comforting counselor like me. There's another part of it. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Ruach HaKodesh. But I want to read 1 Samuel 15. Listen to this nicely. 1 Samuel 15. Shemuel said, Does Adonai take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Adonai says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice and heeding orders than that of fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery, stubbornness like the crime of idolatry, because you have rejected the word of Adonai. He too has rejected you as king. Let's keep going. Let's leave it at that. That was supposed to be 2.23, I think. My dyslexic nature came in. So, he says that obeying God is more important. And he said this in, in those times. 
when they were still doing sacrifices, he says, guys, obeying me is actually more important than going and giving your sacrifice. That means nothing if you don't love me. How do you love someone? How do you love someone? Do you just wave at them every now and again? Hey! Is that love? No. How do you love... Let's see. How do you love your parents? Hello? Right. Do you do what they say? Most times? Or sometimes? Which one is it? Most times. Good. Well done. Good answer. Well done, Richard. <laughs> Guys, it's all about love at the end of the day. And this is why Yeshua kept harping on that. It's all about love. If you love God, if you truly love God, you will do what He wants in your life. You will let Him lead you. 1 John 5 verse 3 says, If you love God, you will obey His commands. It's all about love. Salvation rests on faith. But love needs to follow. You got saved. Why? Because you realize that that water was soon going to cover you. And you needed another covering to lift you up. You realized how broken you were. You got saved. But there's got to be something where you walk with God, right? It's not just... Hey, I'm your friend, but I'm never going to speak to you. I'm never going to hang out with you. I'm not going to give you nice things. I'm just going to ignore you. And every now and again, I might WhatsApp you and say, Hey, can I have a hundred bucks? Or, Hey, can you give me a lift here? Or, Hey, I'm really battling with something. Can you help me? You know, the beautiful thing about that is God will always respond to your WhatsApp. He will always come forward. He will always be there for you. But we have this weird way of accepting everything that he has made and given for us and still walking away we walk away from him because we want what we want i'm not going to read isaiah 52 it's quite long but it does speak of the good news to come the gospel to come please read this when you have time that's a good reference to the gospel. Okay? One that I want to focus on is this one. Which uh, Ezekiel 36. <laughs> Do you ever want new covenant or renewed covenant scriptures? Jeremiah 31, verse 31 onwards, and Ezekiel 36 uh, from 22. But I'm going to read you. From 24, it says, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you from all the countries, and return you to your own soil. Think of those northern kingdom peeps. Disappeared. God says He's going to gather them all back. Has that happened yet? No. Not really. We've got a lot of people living in Israel at this point. There's probably some of the northern kingdom people there that think they are part of the northern kingdom. There might even be some of us here. But have they all been gathered back to their own soil? No. He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new inside you. I will take the stony heart of your flesh and give you a, uh, I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit inside you and cause you to live by my ways, my, by, by my laws. Respect my rulings and obey them. You will live in the land I gave to your ancestors. You will be my people. I will be your God. And I will save you from this and multiply this and summon the grain here and etc. etc. He's going to give you a spirit. This is part of the gospel. This is what Paul was preaching in Galatia. This is what he was preaching in Athens. This is most likely what he said to Nero. He would have said this. And the beautiful thing about Paul is he's so clever that he would be able to take little bits of each thing and craft it according to who he's speaking to. And that's why you see at the Areopagus in Athens, he saves some. When the Spirit comes inside you 
and you've accepted Yeshua as the Messiah, the fact that He's atoned for your sins, that you are a new creation, that you've had that baptism, and the Spirit comes upon you, what happens? What happens? Most of the time we think that when we come up out that water, a dove is going to descend and sit on our forehead. No. No. It doesn't. We're not Yeshua. Okay? I remember Vince when he would tell the story. The first time he got baptized, he came up out of the water and he was like, <laughs> there's water in his nose. And he, you know, you don't feel that special after a baptism, right? For most of us. Sometimes people come out that water and they start swinging Swahili. <laughs> the thing is, that's, God will work with you in a way that you understand. He will work with you. Train up a child in the way that they bend and they will never swear from the Lord. God will work with you with your frame of reference. He will work with you so that you can identify and relate to Him in a deep and, and meaningful way. When the Spirit comes on you in the future or at that specific time or at any specific time, there's manifestation of gifts. This is also part of the Gospel. There's gifts you can go read on about. Speaking in tongues, healing, teaching. These gifts are an important aspect of the gospel. You cannot just expect to receive gifts like this either. God will give it to you when He needs to give it to you. He will make a way so that you can get closer to Him. This is important to understand. He will, he will come down and wake you up when He needs to wake you up. For those of you that have had not had that experience yet, be patient. Pray for that experience. Ask God, God, please, I thank you for everything you've done for me. Can you please reveal yourself to me? A, a few of you, that, haven't, that hasn't even happened yet. And I pray that it does happen. Because when it does happen, what's the first thing that people notice when the Spirit is in you? A change. How you, act. you are completely different. My mother thought I was insane. What? Vince's mother thought he was insane. Because we were one creation, completely of the world, and then all of a sudden, and I remember the day, I remember the day, it was, it was in, it was a few times, but it really hit me in Israel. That's when the light bulb went, ding, and everything just went, ah, oh, I understand. <laughs> yes, that was one of, that, that was one of them, yeah? That was one of them, boy. Guys, if you haven't changed... If you are still the old creation, but yet you've been baptized and yet you've accepted the gospel and you've accepted Yeshua, you've got to ask yourself, what are you doing? You're supposed to die in that water and come up a new creation. You're supposed to change. God has called you to be the salt and the, the light. The light shines in dark places. If you are not shining in dark places... You've got to check yourself. If you are not agitating people with the salt, you've got to check yourself. You know, if you're an evangelist and you run around and you start throwing out this, this good news, people are going to get upset with you. That's like salt in their eyes. They scream and then they sometimes want to claw you out. I've seen lots of funny Facebook, uh, YouTube videos. Yes? Um, with that whole thing, I think what the whole thing? This. Yeah. It's, it's a holy fire that cleans and purifies and it gives us, it ignites things in us. It's very beautiful. But I don't know if everyone undergoes that process um, from, because it will be the baptism process. Right. It's something like you can just now do. It's just not something you do. You don't even baptize yourself because it says in, in John, no. Messiah baptizes you. 
Yeah, but you, bap you literally put yourself in that water, right? Because you're already you're entering into his, because you're in the body of Messiah, you're entering into his body, basically. Yeah. So you're not your own anymore, but we act like we're our own. So we want to do what we want to do. So that's still slowly being worked with God's so Look, for some of us, it's a fast process. For some of us, it's a slow process. Some of us change overnight. Some of us change, revert, change, revert, change. You need to watch out for that. If you're going to commit to the Lord, commit to the Lord. He doesn't want you half in, half out. He wants you all in. That's a relationship. A relationship cannot function if I WhatsApp once a week, if I WhatsApp once a month, if I phone you, every now and again. It cannot function like that. You've got to speak to God. You've got to get to know God. And that's how the change happens. The more you know God, the more He comes to you. Yeah? Any questions about this? Do you understand the gospel now? The stuff that you believe? Thank you, boy. Guys, it's important to understand your foundations. This is the foundation, but the foundation goes deeper than this. This is the basis of your trust. This is the basis of your faith. If you don't believe in this, there's a problem. You've got to believe. That sets that off. You have to pray. If it hasn't happened to you yet, you have to pray. You have to ask God to show Himself to you. Yes, my love. Be obedient, so obedience. It's got everything to do with your heart. It's it's got everything to do with your heart. That's why Yeshua said it all rests on love. How much do you love God? How much are you willing to give up? How much do you want to change? How much do you want to do for Him? How much do you want to stick out for Him? He wants you to be set apart. He wants you to be a light. He wants you to be salt. He wants you to be weird in this world. Because if you're weird in this world, people are going to ask you, hey, why are you weird? And then you're going to say, ah, let me tell you about my God. <laughs> Craig? Repent. That's actually really, yeah. We need to add that in. Right. Yes. True repentance. Right. And don't go back. That's spot on. Yeah. Yes. If you haven't experienced, so if you haven't experienced the Holy Spirit and um, stepped into by faith, stepped into operation, the gifts of the Spirit, and all those things, go back and check. 
check the repentance, yeah, because that's a major factor in the sum, yeah. Oh, you're back there. Uh-huh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm confused as to the Jews when they saw them having the contract and then having the covenant, right? And now with the new covenant, we have like the covenant in our hearts, but now the Jews don't have it. We'll have deal with that next time. I'll deal with that afterwards. Okay. We'll deal with that next time. Let's, let's, I need to get chapter one done, yeah. Yes. Oh, resurrection for living forever. So that's what he says here, John 11. You will not die. Quickly, Logan. Right, I won't rub it out. Okay, so that sets the framework for starting at verse 6. Now listen to what he says. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. What is the different gospel they're preaching? They're saying that you've got to do all of this... That's fine, but you've got to get circumcised as well. How do we know that? It's all throughout Galatians. You're going to see it. Which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you. Let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again. If anybody, is a, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. What gospel did they accept? The one that Paul gave them. Okay? And remember what I said? Other people were coming in to try to pervert this. Because in Judaism at that time, the more people you get in, the more points for you, buddy. Well done, you converted another. Great, let's get as many people circumcised as possible. Every time it mentions the circumcised in the New Testament, you've got to think of those people. It means Jewish people, but the circumcision party are the people that are aiming to get you circumcised so that your sacrifice is, is associated to you, which is nonsense. Verse 10, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. He's a servant here. You've got to understand that. Paul called by God. Verse 11. I wanted you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Yeshua. When did he receive this? Yes, he did. But God told Ananias. In Acts 9, 15 to 16, he says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Who are the people of Israel? Those northern, the northern kingdom that was lost. And technically us now. God gave him that revelation. Some people believe that you'll see later on he goes to Arabia for a while. Some really clever scholars believe that when he was in Arabia, he sat down and he spent a lot of time trying to make sense of the Torah, of the oral law, how it fits into this gospel. How do Gentiles fit in? How does the Northern Kingdom fit in? How do the Jews fit in? He had to frame this entire thing that was breathed in by the Holy Spirit, which is most of the New Testament, to give it to the people. To give it to certain people at the right time. Okay? 13. For you have heard my previous way of life in Ju Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. What is the traditions of his fathers? The last time I did this was in Luke. And we broke down what the traditions of the fathers are. And this is an important thing to understand as well. Because a lot of what he is addressing is traditional elements, is oral law. So, what is the Torah? First of all, let's start with this. We did this last time. What's the capital? What is this for? Torah, which are the first five books, right? What is the N for? How much? Nevi'im. Nevi'im. Which is? 
Ah, you guys got this wrong last time. What is it? Prophets, yes. Prophets, first five books. And then the K? Well done. Hey, we're learning. Good disciple. Eh? Get to Vim, which is? Writing. This is the teachings, basically. Torah is the teachings. The K to Vim is the writings. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, all of that. That is the Torah. That is what the scripture was when they said all scripture is God breathed, inspired, good for teaching, good for doctrine, good for rebuking, etc. It was this. Okay? You've got to understand that. New Testament was written 50 to 90 years after that point. Now, yes, all good Israelites would have understood this part. There's another part. It's called the Talmud. I forgot to bring my one book. I bought, I actually bought one of the um, books. And there's plenty of them. But I, I was very interested to see what they actually get up to in this, in this Talmud. I wanted to see what was going on. Oddly, any of it makes sense to me. But anyway, I'm not as studious as Paul. The Talmud is made up of two elements. It is the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah was uh, it's the oral law the oral law was from they believe god gave moses a whole bunch of information and he had to transfer it down uh, download it to everybody and they had to download it to their sons and their sons and their sons and their sons and their sons, and their sons for a really long time until they actually codified it in between 200 bc and 200 a.d the mishnah is the list of laws, one of them being the one that Yeshua was rebuking when he said, when the guy said, why don't you wash your hands before you eat? That is not a commandment in the Torah. That comes from this. Okay? The Mishnah is the oral law. The Gemara, not that Marvel character. <laughs> not Gemara, Gemara uh, was written in about the 4th and 5th centuries. That's considered uh, the commentary to the Mishnah. So that links into this, but it's the commentary. There's 63 volumes. 63 volumes of information. These two things together make the Talmud. So when I say Talmud, I'm talking about the oral law and I'm talking about the commentary related to the oral law. Okay? Make sense? Like, like That's like the Gemara to the, to the Bible. Okay? Um, you get two types of Talmuds. You get the Babylonian. And you get the Jerusalem. Now, one was written in the 4th century. One was written in the 5th century. Both very similar stuff, but different things. These Talmuds were then codified into something called the Mishneh Torah. Mishneh Torah. Don't, won't give it a big T. Mishneh Torah, and that was from Maimonides in 1180. This is considered the code of Jewish religion, the law, to them. When you say Torah, to them, what's firing off in their brain? This and this at the same time. That's what's firing off in their brain. So if you say Torah to them, they're thinking of all the laws written in Yah and Yah for that and the Torah. There's a Jewish thing called one duff a day. A duff is a page. One page a day. Of these they spend a lot of time studying the Torah and not a lot of time going over the Torah and then there's another one which is called the Shulchan Aruch Shulchan Aruch and that was written in 1563 
AD. Um, it's dubbed in English as the Code of Jewish Law. It's got six volumes. This has got six volumes. And these are big books, eh? This one has got 42 books. That's what it means. 42 volumes of books. <laughs> this one's got 63. The Babylonian one has got 73. Each of these books have like 600 pages or something and then they're like A4. So they don't mess around. You've got Hebrew on the one side and you've got English on the one side and they, they write in like squares. It's beautiful. Um, there's a lot of cool stories in there. And in the Talmud we have insight into certain things. Like Logan was saying, you know, 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, which was funny enough when the time that Yeshua was crucified, the red scarlet that they used to tie on the gates of the temple, when they used to off the scapegoat and tie a red cord onto him, that would turn white traditionally to mark on the Day of Atonement that's coming up, to mark on the Day of Atonement that their sins were forgiven. Forty years prior to the destruction of the temple written in Yah, that stopped happening. Why didn't their light bulbs go off? They just sacrificed Yeshua. Something should have made sense to them. That's why there's probably a lot of secret believers. But anyway, after that, today you have something called e-ink or responsa. So as a Jewish person, if you're worried about the law, you focus on this. If you want to ask your rabbi something, you go on the internet today and you ask the rabbi. Dear rabbi, I own a robotic cat that does flips in the mall on a Shabbat. Is it wrong? Is it considered work? And then the rabbi will respond to you. And then whatever the rabbi decides is law. And if you go against it, you're going against God. This is the understanding. When, when in Acts 15 they say you're trying to put the yoke on them that we couldn't bear, it was this. There are people that come out of Judaism because they cannot bear this weight. They have to keep studying to know if they're breaking a law. When they come out, they feel so free. Because they don't have 73 plus 42 plus 6 plus 63 million pages to go through. You've got to understand. What Paul was saying is, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father's. He was zealous for this. He was zealous for this. Under Gamliel, he studied this. He knew it. He knew it. And this is going to come up again in Galatians. When he deals with Peter. It's five past eight. I think we leave it there. Any questions about this? Okay, we stopped at verse... 14. <laughs> Guys, um, I would encourage you all to go read Galatians. It's only six chapters. We're already halfway through chapter one. If you haven't read Galatians in a while or you haven't read it at all, I would encourage you to go read it. It's one of the most fundamental books, letters that you need to understand in the Bible. There's been a lot, of, a lot of theology based off of this book. Do you know that there's 41,000 denominations in the world right now? This was a few years ago. 41,000 denominations. That's mad. That's why it's important to break it down like this. So that when you look at what is being said, when you understand the culture of the time, when you understand the people of the time, and you understand the man behind the letter... It makes a lot more sense. Okay? Alright. Let's pray.